Hello, Giants fans. Thank you for watching. Today we have a very special guest, and I'm very excited about it. Justin Pennick from the Talking Giants and Bleeding Blue podcast is here to join me. How's it going today? Well, it's going great. Uh, as you can see, because this is not just a podcast, we're on YouTube. I am outside. I'm on my porch, uh, and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the nice New Jersey weather. Uh, how are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Um, I'm, I'm down here in South Florida, so I've, I've been having nice weather, but it's, it's nice when in the Northeast, you know, it starts heating up a little bit. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate, appreciate having you on. And um, I've, I've been listening to your podcast for a long time, the Talking Giants podcast. You guys got to check it out. And he does a lot of stuff on YouTube as well and the Bleeding Blue podcast as well. So definitely check that out. I'll put it in the description. Um, I, I think the biggest topic that's been going on recently, and you did mention before that you're a criminal justice major. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, what do you think is going to happen? Like, what's your prediction with this whole DeAndre Baker situation? Do you think he's going to possibly face any jail time? Is he going to end up not missing uh, any time with the Giants? Like, what, what's your prediction? What do you think is going to end up happening? Yeah, I think the bond hearing was was very, very interesting because of, number one, the outcome of it, but also, number two, what you had the prosecution asking. The prosecution was really asking that DeAndre Baker and, um, I believe, Dunbar, they were both asking them to be held pretrial without any bond, to not have the opportunity to post their bond, to pay their bail, to be released. That's what that basically means, to be held in pretrial detention. So... I have a feeling that the prosecution is either going to go in one of two directions since the judge basically said, you know what, we're not going to go by that such high standard that the prosecution was setting, that high standard of proof. We're not going to go by that. We're going to allow them to post bond. We're going to allow them to be free men. We're going to allow Baker to be a free man until trial or until further criminal proceedings go forward. So this could either mean one of two things. The prosecution is not going to back down. And something that this particular jurisdiction in Florida, they are pretty punitive and they are pretty, they do like to pretty uh, go forth with their criminal proceedings in kind of a punitive manner where they're not really going to be willing. Maybe they're not going to be willing to cut a, a deal, maybe not willing to be cutting an agreement with Baker where they want to, you know, they'll keep pushing for trial. Um, and then Baker's lawyer and, and, in retrospect, on the other side, uh, they may not want to be pushing for a deal. They may want to go to trial, and they may feel that they have a legitimate case since even Baker's lawyer during that bond hearing has said, hey, I have some more affidavits. I have some more affidavits from other witnesses saying that, hey, uh, I'm not going to reveal them yet because that's like a strategy. So I honestly do think I've, uh, I've been a fan of let's just wait and see. Let's wait for more facts to come out, and let's be patient I'm still going to preach that, but if you, again, if you had to, you know, if you, if you said that, Justin, you have to give me an answer right now, and, you, and don't, don't just do a cop-out answer, he may have to accept a plea bargain, and he may be found guilty, but I do not think he is going to get any jail time, do not think he's going to get any prison time, uh, because I genuinely do think that if there is a deal that's going to be worked out, and Baker's representation they would accept something that is you know maybe it's a guilty plea but he's not going to be spending time any time in jail not going to be spending time any time in prison that's what i'm guessing that's what i'm guessing i, I kind of do think that uh, lawyers uh baker's lawyers they kind of do have a really good case that's kind of built up and they're throwing all i think this whole madden thing is a whole smoke screen you know everybody loved talking about oh was baker playing madden and i think that's a whole smoke screen that i think it's brilliant it's people that's continuing to talk about the case um so, but these affidavits, that's the important part. Those affidavits that Baker's lawyer hasn't shown yet, uh, those are probably the most important part of that case. But it was a good sign for Baker that the judge didn't side with the prosecution. And he's like, you know what? We're going to let you, we're going to let you go. We're going to allow you to post bond. That was a good sign for Baker for hopefully things to go forward. Yeah, I think that's really well put. And um, it was really interesting to be able to watch the hearing on, uh, I think it's on YouTube, or I saw mm -hmm. it somewhere on social media. And it didn't seem like, like you said, the, um, the prosecutions might have a tough time with this one. But um, I'm not, I, I don't consider myself, you know, on your level with, with the legal analysis. But I, I think that you, you made a lot of good points. And yeah, I thought the Madden sort of evidence was strange as well. And that you know, like you said, it could be just very much a smokescreen. So um, transitioning to my next question, because we're talking about, you know, the supposed starting cornerback for the Giants for 2020, that even if he does get through this legal proceeding, he might face NFL 
or even Giants like team penalties. So um, it doesn't seem 100% likely like it'll definitely start again in 2020. And I did write an article on this topic. Who would you start at the opposite cornerback? Because we all know James Bradbury is going to start. Who's, who should start opposite Bradbury in your opinion? I want to say Julian Love because I'm just so shell-shocked to the notion and to the idea of, okay, here we are. Again, we've invested another offseason in our secondary, but we have one of our cornerback spots where we're having last year, it was Grant Haley, who was an undrafted free agent, second year undrafted free agent out of Penn, out of Penn State. And then, okay, let's just say we're living in a world without DeAndre Baker. Do we really want to be relying on – the guy that I would rely on is Corey Ballantyne, right? If, if, we're, if we're taking maybe Julian Love is a, is a nickel corner and he's a safety, if, we're, if we are solely uh, you know, putting him in pen in those two spots, then we're relying on Corey Ballantyne, who, coming out of a small school, number one, didn't play a full year last year. He was healthy for all 16 games, but still didn't get that full 16-game you know, exposure. And then also sixth-round pick. You know, second year, sixth round pick. So again, even though the Giants secondary, this is the strongest part of their defense and one of the strongest parts of their team, you can make an argument on paper. But once again, there's one of those spots that we're going into saying, oh, that can, that can be such a liability. Now, Corey Ballantyne, he's the fastest cornerback on the team. You saw him last year. He was out there returning kicks. Usually the guys that are returning kicks, they're not doing that maybe because they have great field vision. You know, let's just put the fastest guy back, at, back, back there and let's hope for the best. Valentine is the fastest corner that we have on this roster right now. And that works well for Bradbury's defense because it relies on a lot of man-to-man. It relies a lot of press. They, rely, they play press, uh, press man-to-man, I think, the fifth, at the fifth highest rate in the National Football League in 2019. And that was with the Miami defense, which half of those guys should have been, been on the CFL to begin with. Yeah. So hopefully with a little bit more trust that um, Bradbury uh, can put in these guys and can put in these pieces – Maybe he'll run even man to man a little bit more. It's going to be hard for him to do since uh, since he ran it hot, since he ran it so much to begin with. But all of this is to say, even though Valentine he has a lot of potential, he's still a second year six round pick. I honestly feel a lot more comfortable with putting Love out there. Love played at the boundary. He played outside corner at Notre Dame, uh, and also Darnay Holmes. And uh, I hate to say it, you know, Grant Haley is still on this roster. You know, maybe Grant Haley improved on his ball skills a little bit. I wouldn't bank on it. But Darnay Holmes at rookie, you can start him at slot corner and maybe feel and maybe feel like you can get away with it enough. But also, uh, McKinney, a guy like McKinney, an, an advantage of having a guy like McKinney is he is going to be playing slot corner without actually playing slot corner. And this is kind of difficult to describe maybe when I can't show you. But you're, you're, take, take my word for it. I know, and I, there, there are some things that, I, that I'm iffy on. But I know this is a fact. I watched my McKinney tape. And what you saw at Alabama is he's playing maybe five, ten yards off the line of scrimmage. And it's like, okay, even though you know McKinney is a safety, that's his natural position. But he is playing in that slot nickel role. So you are going to see McKinney as a nickel cornerback without actually being a cornerback. So you're, you're going to see him playing in that role. So that requires, you know, Holmes won't be on the field as much. And what we want as a – I feel like as a Giants fan base and what Graham wants, we want to find a way to have – of Love, Peppers, McKinney, three of this defense's most talented players already. I even think McKinney is that talented already. We want them to be on the field at the same time, and that's going to be the kind of way that they're going to do it. Hopefully we're going to have you know, Peppers, McKinney, and Love all alternating roles all year long, disguising looks pre-snap. So I do think the answer is in-house. Valentine, I think he has potential. But again, relying on that second-year six-round pick, it makes me nervous because it's like, oh, we're doing this again. Um, be, uh, Love obviously played the outside boundary in college. He could be an answer. Um, and then obviously McKinney, uh, McKinney just he can play that slot corner, which can allow Love to move to the boundary. So there are answers and there is options for uh, Graham Judge in house. Yeah, I I agree with like so much of what you said. And um, the thing with Julian Love that you know a lot of people criticize him for is he doesn't have the top end speed. But you can say the same thing about DeAndre Baker. DeAndre Baker, I think, ran yeah. a four five forty. So for some of the same reasons, I think Julian Love would be okay on the outside. I think DeAndre Baker is okay on the outside too. And um, he's just, yeah, like you said, he's just one of the best football players on the defense. And you got to find you know time on the field for him. And and it was interesting, like how he didn't really play that much in the beginning of last year, and finally 
when he got an opportunity at strong safety replacing Peppers. Um, I think he actually played better than Peppers last season. I'm not saying he's a better player, but it seems like he was better at strong safety. So I, I like Julian Love a lot. And, uh, and I like what you said about McKinney too, um, because I was such a big Isaiah Simmons fan. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a Clemson fan, if you didn't know, but yeah. I wanted Isaiah Simmons in the first round really badly. And then when we got McKinney, I kind of felt better about not taking Simmons, uh, which will help me transition to my next question for you, because we ended up taking Andrew Thomas as our first round pick. And there's been a lot of debate about how like the offensive line should be configured. And um, I think Andrew Thomas should just start off at left tackle because I think he's, you know, already probably the best offensive tackle on the team. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to help him in the short term. And then also in the long term, it's going to help him to have reps there. Um, so who would you start at left tackle and right tackle for the uh, 2020 Giants? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Andrew Thomas should be at left tackle. I think he is the best option at left tackle. You don't take a guy number four. And this is kind of like the same argument that you can make for quarterbacks, too. There are some within the analy analytics community that say, oh, if you draft the quarterback, especially if you draft him maybe top five, top ten, you should, you should start him right away. Because on-field physical reps are much, much, much more valuable than mental reps. A lot of I think a lot of people overvalue mental reps. Go out there, do it. Go out there, hey, be successful, great. But also go out there and make mistakes. Get that out of your way your rookie year. There's a reason why people say that you shouldn't fully evaluate quarterbacks after their rookie year. That's exactly why. So they can go out there, they can make those mistakes. So I don't understand the notion. If positional value, quarterback is the most important position in sports, it's the most important position in football, left tackle is the second most important position in football, why should you coddle tackles? Go out there, let them do it. Let them rock and roll. You don't draft a franchise right tackle at, at fourth. I mean, you know, <laughs> I would have been fine with Jedrick Rose. It would have been chance. It would have been risky. Because, But then the idea is that you would eventually move him to left tackle. Andrew Thomas, I, I think it's 1A and 1B in terms of, uh, if we're talking about best tackle prospects, Thomas was up there. But why should we coddle Thomas, right? Why should we coddle him? If, <clears throat> excuse me, if he's going to be a guy that is going to get discouraged and he's going to lose all of his confidence after year one because maybe he struggles a little bit, then you want to know what? That's a bad job on coaching. And number two, that's not a franchise guy that you want on your team anyway. You know, Eric Flowers, getting, you know, him, him maybe getting frustrated, maybe him losing confidence year one, and then he just wasn't really good to begin with, let's face it. Yeah, but yeah. that's not a guy that you want on your franchise and to be a cornerstone of your franchise. You know, Peyton Manning threw 28 interceptions his rookie year. You didn't see him put his hands in his face and then not become the greatest quarterback of all time. So you can make the same argument for left tackle and say, if you're drafting a guy to be a cornerstone of your franchise, you know, oh, he struggles year one, God forbid, he shouldn't lose his confidence. You should have done your work pre-draft to say, hey, this guy's a hard worker, and it seems like it is. It seems like Andrew Thomas is a really hard worker, and it seems like he's a leader. I even saw uh, one of those articles that Giants.com put out that the Georgia coach was reflecting on like this great halftime speech that Andrew Thomas gave to the team, and that's right. awesome. That's the stuff that you want to see. That's the stuff that you really like. So Andrew Thomas should be out there, left tackle, day one, year one, number one, because he's the best option. And number two, because that's just the right thing to do to develop your franchise and develop your franchise left tackle. You're developing your franchise quarterback. You know, you're still, you're still trying to develop everything around Saquon Barkley. And, you know, that's what that pick was an investment in those, in those two guys, your two cornerstones of your franchise, which is, you know, Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Um, but let's go to right tackle. Now, I said back in February, I actually, Talking Giants actually had a Valentine's Day episode. And, uh, and I said this, and I love this line that I said, so I'm going to pat myself on the back. The New York football giants are waving the white flag on the 2020 season if they are simply slating in Nate Solder at left tackle. And I said that back in February. Now, because really, think about it. There is, and this is a hot take, there is an alternate universe where if Nate Solder is an average left tackle, Pat Shermer still has his job. Yeah. I'm not saying that he should be the head coach. I'm not saying that, oh, he shouldn't have been fired. But think about it. Like, think of how many fumbles Daniel Jones doesn't lose. Think of not, even, not only just the fumbles, but think of how many drives aren't derailed by a Nate Solder pressure where Daniel Jones maybe doesn't have the best pocket man manipulation, so he's standing in the pocket, and he's, you know, Nate, you know, the backside of Nate Solder is hitting Daniel Jones in the face. How many drives were derailed simply because Nate Solder would allow pressure and also, 
God forbid, now we have a quarterback that likes to hold onto the ball for a little bit longer because he wants to push the ball down the field instead of checking it down like Eli Manning did. And I love Eli, you know, but Eli Manning was a shell of himself 2016 for the, for the rest of his career compared to 2014 and before that. He was a shell of himself. And McAdoo and Reese ruined him because they ruined his psyche with that bad offensive line. But anyway, anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a rant for another day. But I honestly do believe that if the Giants slated Solder at left tackle, they would have been waving the flag on this season before it even began. So I'm glad they went left tackle, and I'm glad they went Thomas. But now, you know, instead of just trashing, trashing Solder, I think the best version of the Giants in 2020 are the Giants with Nate Solder at right tackle, with a veteran, the solid, average, <laughs> average presence of Nate Solder at right tackle, especially him playing next to Zeitler. I can imagine that will make him a lot better in terms of a guy that could pick up more stunts. Maybe he's, you know, he's been playing longer. He's uh, just more successful than Zeitler. He's more experienced than Hernandez on that other side. So just playing next to Zeitler will hopefully make him a little bit better. You're also feeling a little bit better about putting Solder on the right side because Jones can actually see. You know, that's, that's not his blind side. So maybe he can manipulate the pocket a little bit better. So if Solder's going to be allowing some more pressures, that'll be okay. So I really do think the best version of the Giants are with a veteran presence of Nate Solder at right tackle and Andrew Thomas at left tackle. Yeah, I, I wrote an article for GmanHQ.com, and uh, I talked about my ideal offensive line configuration, and that's what I did have. And uh, I would put Nate Soldier at right tackle as well to start off the season. And like you said last year, like he, he really struggled and we could have won a lot of those close games. Um, you know, if it wasn't for a lot of the, you know, the fumbles that Jones had that were, you know, many times caused by Nate Soldier getting, uh, getting beat kind of quickly. And then, um, yeah, I, I think he's, you know, he's a veteran. He could bounce back. He had a lot of issues last year, you know, off the field yeah. that could have affected his play. But I think, you know, you start him off there and then, I talked about this on the uh, Entertainer's like YouTube show. I said if he struggles, we have some options now, like behind him at like Cam Fleming or maybe Nick Gates. But uh, I actually like Gates a little better at another position. But I wanted to ask you, um, you know, after cornerback, which will be a very interesting, you know, competition in training camp. Who would I think center might be the most interesting on the entire team? Like who's going to end up playing there to start the season? So. Uh, I'll ask you again, like, if you had to decide right now before you see any preseason games or anything like that, who would you start as the center for the, uh, you know, the starting Giants? This is an interesting conversation because I'm still not fully set on maybe who I would want because we saw Pulley have some sort of success in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then he had his one little opportunity against the Jets in 2019. And it was terrible, terrible. Jalapio's coming back from another career-altering injury. You know, he tore his Achilles, but he's on the roster. A lot of people forget that. He's on the roster. Giants organization, they really like him, so he is going to be competing. You have Lemieux, who was, you know, drafted as a guard, but he's raw. But the one thing that Lemieux has that you can argue that no other center or no other guy that's going to be competing for center has, he has play strength. And mm. that is something that the Giants have been lacking in the interior offensive line for years. They have been lacking that anchor. You know, maybe they have a guy with good footwork. Maybe they have a guy that can move well in space. Halapio moved pretty well in space. You know, there were some, there were like, you know, some screens that you saw. I remember there was one against Philadelphia where I actually pointed out on NFL Game Pass. You know how they, you know how they like chart the plays, and they, yeah. you know, you have those guys. You see a. The alignment pulling, Barkley went here, the receiver ran this far, the quarterback ran here and there, and then he threw the ball all the way down the field. So NFL game pass, they can chart where guys go. And I remember some screenplays where it's like, oh, you know, when they get when they get Jalapio moving in space, he can move some people and he can move himself and stay in front of the play, which is pretty cool. But again, you're not really asking your center to be pulling that often. So you want him to be an anchor. You know, it's not like a guard where they're pulling left and right a ton. So Jalapio hasn't had that play strength. I really don't think Pulley has that play strength. Uh, Lemieux, they drafted him because he's a tough guy. He's a tough, nailed guy, and he has that play strength. Now, can it be year one? Can he put it all together year one? That's, that's not likely. You draft a guy you know, in, 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 the, in the fifth round for a reason. You know, he should probably be a developmental player. They even did that with Perry. You know, guy, they're, they're doing these to develop these players, which is not a bad thing, which is good. Again, you're investing in Jones. You're investing in Barkley. That's a very good thing. 
And then the other guy that we're obviously not talking about is Nick Gates. Now, again, Nick Gates is, uh, is a guy that we have that question of play strength. He is smart. He can move. He's versatile. He played guard during preseason last year. He played tackle. He started at tackle last year, and he looked good. Anytime that Nick Gates has gotten an opportunity, he's taken advantage of it. You can't say the same for Jalapio. Jalapio's had numerous opportunities, and he hasn't looked great. You can't say the same about Pulley. And Pulley's one opportunity last year didn't look good. And Gates' is, you know, limited opportunities last year when both Zeitler was hurt and when you had Remmers was hurt, Gates looked good. Gates look good, yeah. and that kind of that probably the guy that we have the most hope for right now is Gates because he's you know again versatile and he's actually done good things with the opportunities that he's had. But tackles, I think he is a natural tackle. He has more of a natural tackle kind of body. You know, he's a little taller, he's a little thinner. You know, he doesn't have as much of that gut as like that interior offensive lineman gut that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a question of play strength. Can a tackle? have the same play strength and the same mean streak as you want your interior offensive lineman to have. And that's the biggest question for me. I don't have, I, I know for a fact that Gates will be able to, you know, understand and he'll be able to call things out at the line of scrimmage. He'll be able to call out the protections. You know, there were questions of if, if Jalapio could do that well, there's also questions about Hal Hunter, but we don't need to be, we're, we're, we're moving on from, from that former offensive line coach that we had. So, the Gates's brain isn't the problem. It's it's can his strength hold up? Um, so that may uh, we we'll we'll see how that center position that center battle plays out. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I ended up choosing Gates in my article for the starting center position, and there were a couple of games last year um, where I think Zeitler went down with an injury, and Gates ended up playing right guard, and he graded out really well according to yeah. Pro Football Focus in in those games. And um, yeah, he's. He's a tackle by trade. Like, that's what he played at Nebraska. But he ended up, um, you know, I don't think he went drafted because he didn't have, like, the long arms or, you know, it, c- it could have been a, multi- a multitude of reasons. But, you know, some maybe he can, you know, bulk up even a, a little bit more, yeah. like you said, and, and uh, end up playing on the inside where he can, he can play well. Like, he played well last year uh, going in for Zeitler. So, yeah, the offensive line should be improved. And, um there was a video recently by uh, the Hub Sports, and he was saying, and I wanted to ask you about this. He was saying how Saquon Barkley might get some MVP consideration this season. So I, I just wanted to to ask you your opinion about that. Do you think it's a a possibility um, if he stays healthy and with the improved offensive line? You know, Jones should be better in his second year. Defense will be a little bit better, hopefully. Um, do you think? Barkley has any chance at MVP? Is that a, a smart bet to make at whatever odds he is at this time? What we should be aiming to do as a football team, and this is kind of like how we're building our team. We should be aiming to be like the Titans. We should be aiming to be like the 49ers. We should be aiming to be like the Ravens. And particularly the, what the Ravens do, because I actually know that this is, a, this, is, you know, this is the stat that I'm going to be kind of going off of. The Ravens are awesome at early in football games scoring first and getting leads. What are you able to do once you get it, once you get a lead and when you have, you know, maybe if you're leading by one score, two scores, you're able to ground and pound. You're able to ground and pound. You're able to control the time of possession. And that is the formula that the New York football giants, they need to have this year. I want to see early efficiency in early passing by Daniel Jones. I want to get the lead. I want to get it quick. I want to take the, any momentum, take the air out of the lungs of our opponent and then we ground and pound with Saquon Barkley and we control the time possession because that's what we're going to need to do. We're going to need to control the time possession because we cannot rely on this defense getting stops and playing the, you know, the field position game. We can't rely on that. So I want to see early efficiency with Daniel Jones. And then guess what? If we have a lead for a half, if we have a lead for three quarters, the whole goal would be, okay, Saquon, it's time to go. Okay, offensive line, it's time to go. And then that's where Saquon Barkley is going to be getting, you know, Maybe, you know, he's going to be padding his stats, and that's going to be great, and that's when he'll be getting his MVP consideration. But, you know, I, I hate to – you know, I, I'm a big analytics guy, and I hate to be always like the, the poo-poo on the running back position, but if the Giants are going to – even though, like, Saquon Barkley could very well be the MVP of this team. He very well could be the MVP of the league. But why the Giants are going to be successful, it's because of quarterback play, and it's because of Daniel Jones, because that's going to be the guy that's going to get them leads. It's going to be the guy that's going to push them out early. And that's in a perfect world. 
That's what I would love to happen. I would love Saquon Barkley to get 1,700 rushing yards and to get 25 or, you know, 20, 20 attempts per game and maybe get uh, five other catches. Or 20 attempts is a little much because I think even, let's say, let's say 17, 18 attempts per game. There you go. That's because I remember his rookie year, he averaged like 16 carries per year. So mm -hmm. let's get him all those rushing attempts. Let's make Saquon look good. Um, because guess what? If we're rushing and because we have a lot of rushing yards, that means that we're winning. That means that we're not trailing. And what was the Achilles heel last year for the Giants in 2019? You would blink and we would be down 14 nothing because we would either go and that, not counting the first two games with Eli Manning because we were we were the best team in the NFL for the <laughs> for the first series against Buffalo and the first series against Dallas. We were the best team in the NFL. Eli had us looking great. But besides those games and when Jones started to come in, you blinked, we went three and out, and the defense would allow two scores. And then and the Giants would then decide to play football when we're down 14 nothing, and then you have to play catch-up. Don't want to do that this year. Have to get off the fast starts. That's going to be with Jones's arm. And then hopefully once we have those leads, that's when Saquon could come in, pad those stats, and we're in a good spot. Yeah, I agree. I, I also think Daniel Jones will end up being the MVP of the team if, if we have the kind of season that we want to have. And um, I like what you said about how we're building the team. And we are kind of trying to emulate Tennessee and Baltimore and those teams. And it's so obvious with our draft this season, you know, three of the first five picks were offensive linemen. And even though two of them might not even start or play that much in, in 2020, um, you know, we have major plans for them, you know, in the long term. So that's the, the kind of team that we do need to have to be successful where, you know, we, we get out to leads. Like if you remember last year in the, the playoff game with the Ravens, um, they ended up losing their first playoff game. I think it was to Tennessee and, you know, they, they fell behind and they don't, they just don't play as well when they're behind. So getting out to those early leads is so important. Like you said, especially for a team like ours, like a young team um, where we want to pound the ball. And then Daniel Jones will be much better if he has the play action where, you know, he keeps the linebackers yes. honest. And um, that's the kind of team that I, I'm envisioning us if we, uh, you know, we can exceed expectations this year. And, and I do feel like this is the first time in a while where I feel like we're heading in the right direction and I know we, we, we only had, a, you know, five or six wins last year, but I just feel like we're heading in the right direction. Uh, do you agree with that notion? Is this like the first time in a while where you feel like optimistic about the future with the Giants? Because there's a plan, right? I know Dave Guttelman since day one has said that he's had a plan and maybe this has been a three-year plan. <laughs> but now there seems to be a plan. And I'm going to kind of reiterate the same point that I said before, but I'll just maybe say it in a different way. Daniel Jones, nationally criticized. The pick was criticized. Saquon Barkley, even within giant circles. I don't know, I don't know about how much nationally, but especially within giant circles, there's a portion of the fan base that is split and that is still asking. And I think it's a legitimate question because until you win, the question really isn't going to be answered. You know, was he the right pick? You know, I'm even one that's asking those questions about Saquon Barkley being the right pick. But you root for the guys in blue. You always root for the guys in blue no matter what. And what this draft was is you want to know what – again, I said this point earlier, though. We're going to invest in Daniel Jones, that quarterback, the pick that was uh, criticized by the entire nation, and we are going to invest in that running back that we picked and, you know, which that pick was questioned by, the entire, by some of the fan base. That's an investment in those two guys. And I'm for that. I am 100% for that. You know, <laughs> kind of like I think some people have said this about Leonard Williams. You know, it, it, you're, you're digging your grave. You kind of you have to lie in it. The Giants are lying in it, and I love it. They're not going, you know, maybe uh, picking up. They had the opportunity to pick a flashy wide receiver. Yeah, they, they had the opportunity to do it throughout this entire draft. There was so much wide yeah. receiver draft throughout this entire draft. And I guarantee if maybe if Jerry Reese is here, he's picking one oh, of those yeah. wide receivers. And that's not really like – you know, of course, you can argue that that's an investment for Daniel Jones, but you can even argue that wide receiver is one of, is another like one of those positions like running back that you can find like you know good level replacements kind of anywhere that you can go, whether it's free agency or the draft. So, or they didn't even go and pick a flashy, maybe a flashy edge rusher, or they would have no, well, not even a flashy edge rusher. They would have reached for an edge rusher in this draft. This draft was not really filled with really good edge rushers besides Chasen and besides Young. You would, you would have really been reaching for one. Um, so they invested in the guys that they have chosen to, in, you know, invest their franchise in. They're yeah. continuing to 
those investments. And that is a very, very good sign. If you're going to do it, you know, if you're going to do it with Jones, if you're going to do it with Barkley, invest in them. And that's what they did. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you heard the whining, but that's my dog. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I 100%, I 100% agree. Um, you know, we've, we've invested in, in uh, Barkley, and we've tr- we tried to make him successful in every way possible. I'm really excited to see how he does in uh, Jason Garrett's um, new system and with the improved offensive line. I think they can utilize him a little better in the passing game too, which we saw flashes of last year, like in the Washington game. We had that long touchdown. But um, I think he can, you know, even do more like that, uh, similar to how Christian McCaffrey's used. I don't think he's as good of a, a receiver as McCaffrey at this point, but um, he has similar potential, in my opinion. And if, if you look at him like, like a weapon or like, um, you know, a skill player instead of just a running back, it, uh, you know, it helps justify picking him at second overall. Yes. And, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think Barkley can be. Uh, even better this year. And, and you saw last year when he came back from the ankle, he was a little bit, you know, he wasn't 100% himself. He didn't have the same explosion. But then it, towards the end of the season, you saw those games, those last couple of games, I, I feel like he was his old self again and he had the explosion yeah. back. So I'm, I'm so excited about him and Jones in the second year behind a hopefully improved offensive line. So, um, all right, so I guess to wrap it up, because I wanted to ask you, um, and I do appreciate you coming on and talking and uh, – this has been a lot of fun talking Giants, but I wanted to ask you, since I'm new to this uh, world of, of media and the Giants, and I just started writing in January for Gmin HQ, um, and I just started this YouTube channel, what kind of advice would you give to someone like me? Because there's a lot of people like me who are just starting off on YouTube and, and sports in, in general. So what kind of uh, advice would you give? Because you've been doing this for, for uh, and you've been doing a really good job at it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. But first, I want to affirm you. I want to affirm you because uh, I, I recently followed you because I've seen that, you know, every, every day your videos and your, you know, your content would be popping up on my timeline. And, you know, I, I'm, at a, I'm now at a point where I don't feel like I need to, um, you know, I, I don't need to do like the follow for follow thing. I've kind of stopped that uh, last year. But I, I gave you the follow because you have been doing awesome stuff on social media. Now, I want to emphasize that it's kind of different for everybody. So maybe if you're starting to do YouTube, you know, and YouTube is like the only thing that you're doing, post as much as you can on YouTube. And it'll post like, you know, every single day, multiple times a day, you know, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the algorithm will hopefully pick you up. But for me, myself, I'm a podcaster and that's kind of like how I started. That's where like my roots are. And in terms of having a podcast, um, what I tell people, and I, and this, I started podcasting the 2018 season with Bleeding Blue, and I didn't, I didn't really grow. I, you know, from this, from season start to season's end, I didn't really grow. And I was like, well, what, you know, what am I not doing that everyone else is doing? And part of what I was not doing was I wasn't really posting on social media. I wasn't creating content on social media because what you really have to do is people aren't just going to click on your podcast because you're Justin Pennick. You kind of have to earn, you kind of have to earn that a little bit, and how you earn that is by creating a community and engaging with people on social media. That would be the big thing, you know. I, and this this is something that doesn't change no matter what platform you're posting on. Is how can you create a community of people and how can you engage with people? I would rather have you know 100 people engage with me over and over and over again and have maybe 200 followers than have uh, 10,000 followers but only have 10 people engage with me because it's about who is going to engage, who's going to interact with your content. And the way that you do that first, at least in my experience, now again, YouTube might be a little different, but the way as a podcaster, when I started to engage with people on social media and not just, hey, here's the link to my podcast, go listen to it. And then nobody would listen to it because how, what, are you, what are you doing? How are you incentivizing people to click on? So can you be authentic? Can you be genuine on social media in the best possible way? I, I, know, it's, uh, I know we're living in a world where sometimes social media is being criticized because you can't be authentic and you can't be genuine, but trying to, making an attempt and being yourself and being real with people, that is something that you can do on social media. And if you're authentic and you're genuine on there, 
And if you're just authentic and genuine, you know, and not, and not performing on your podcast, not performing on your show or not performing on your channel, people will therefore connect with you and be like, Hey, this guy is kind of like the same nice guy, nice person that he is on, on social media. I feel like I can connect with him. And then guess what? You know, responding to those YouTube comments, replying to everybody that kind of uh, comments on your posts on social media. Again, you know, you're creating community, you're engaging with people, you're being real, you're being genuine, you're, you're being authentic. So that's honestly the thing that, um, that I would say to, the, you know, if you're kind of starting out and if you're kind of wondering, how can I get more people to click on my content and interact with me? Uh, it's having that at the core, community at the core of everything you do. What can I put out that can reach the most people and that can touch the most people metaphorically? You know, because again, everything's virtually and everything's online. So there you go. That's, that's kind of how I would put it. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Great advice and advice and advice and um been involved in social media in the sense where I'm like actually engaging with people and um I mean I've been on Twitter I think since like you know when it first started but I never posted anything myself I was kind of just watching people that I would actually like follow people like you and other Giants media members um to get my Giants news and just see what people were saying on on topics about the Giants but uh it was it hasn't been until I think January when I started to actually like post stuff myself on, on uh, social media and, and um, I'm not just saying this because they follow me, but all the people that interact with me on Twitter have been like amazing. And it's been so much fun. Like you said to, you know, just be yourself and make posts about stuff that you think is interesting. And, and then when other people think it's interesting too, you, you talk right. about it. And that's been a lot of fun to me. Like that's one of my favorite parts of this whole thing is just uh, like talking giants with people on, I know that's like a talking giants. That's a good name for the podcast. But uh, yeah, just talking giants with people on um, social media has probably been my favorite part of this whole process since I've been uh, writing for Dream and HQ. So I think that's great advice. And I really appreciate you coming on, man. This has been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, if you haven't already, definitely check out the podcast called Talking Giants and uh, Bleeding Blue. Bleeding Blue. Um, and I want to thank you again for coming on. This has been awesome. No problem. Keep on killing it, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.